Roughing It by Mark Twain. He hated intemperance with a more uncompromising animosity than any individual I have ever met of either sex. And he was never tired of storming against it and beseeching friends and strangers alike to be wary and drink with moderation. And yet, if any creature had been guileless enough to intimate that his absorbing nine gallons of straight whiskey during our voyage was any fraction short of rigid or inflexible abstemoniousness, in that self-same moment the old man would have spun him to the uttermost parts of the earth in the whirlwind of his wrath. Mind, I am not saying his whiskey ever affected his head or his legs, for it did not, in even the slightest degree. He was a capacious container, but he did not hold enough for that. He took a level tumbler full of whiskey every morning before he put his clothes on. To sweeten his bulge, bilge water, he said, he took another after he got the most of his clothes on to settle his mind and give him his bearings. He then shaved and put on a clean shirt, after which he recited the Lord's Prayer in a fervent, thundering bass that shook the ship to her kelson and suspended all conversation in the main cabin. Then, at this stage, being invariably by the head or by the stern, or listed to port or starboard, he took one more to put him on an even keel so that he would mind his helium and not miss stays and go about every time he came up in the wind. And now his stateroom door swung open and the sun of his ben benignant face beamed readily out upon men and women and children and he roared his shipments ahoy in a way that was calculated to wake the dead and precipitate the final resurrection. And forth he strode, a picture to look at and a presence to enforce attention. Stalwart and portly, not a gray hair, broad-brimmed, slouch hat, semi-sailor toggery of blue navy flannel, roomy and ample, a stately expanse of shirt front and a liberal amount of black silk neck cloth tied with a sailor knot. Large chain and imposing seals impending from his fob, awe-inspiring feet, and a hand like the hand of providence, as his wailing brethren expressed it. Wristbands and sleeves pushed back halfway to the elbow out of respect for the warm weather and exposing hairy arms, gaudy with red and blue anchors, ships, and goddesses of liberty tattooed in India ink. But these details were only secondary matters. His face was the lodestone that chained the eye. It was a sultry disk, glowing determinedly out through a weather-beaten mask of mahogany and studded with warts, seamed with scars, blazed all over with unfailing fresh slips of the razor, and with cheery eyes under shaggy brows, contemplating the world from over the back of a gnarled crag of a nose that loomed vast and lonely out of the undulating immensity that spread away from its foundations. At his heels frisked the darling of his bachelor estate, his terrier, Fan, a creature no larger than a squirrel. The main part of his daily life was occupied in looking after Fan in a motherly way and doctoring her for a hundred ailments which existed only in his imagination. The Admiral seldom read newspapers and when he did, he never believed anything they said. He read nothing and believed in nothing but the Old Guard, a secessionist periodical published in New York. He carried a dozen copies of it with him always, 
and referred to them for all required information. If it was not there, he supplied it himself out of a bountiful fancy, inventing history, names, dates, and everything else necessary to make his point good in an argument. Consequently, he was a formidable antagonist in a dispute. Whenever he swung clear of the record and began to create history, the enemy was helpless and had to surrender. Indeed, the enemy could not keep from betraying some little spark of indignation at his manufactured history. And when it came to indignation, that was the Admiral's very best hold. He was always ready for a political argument, and if nobody started one, he would do it himself. With his third retort, his temper would begin to rise, and within five minutes he would be blowing a gale, and within fifteen his smoking room audience would be utterly stormed away, and the old man left solitary and alone, banging the table with his fist, kicking the chairs, and roaring a hurricane of profanity. It got so after a while that whenever the admiral approached with politics in his eye, the passengers would drop out with quiet accord, afraid to meet him, and he would camp on a deserted field. But he found his match at last, and before a full company, at one time or another everybody had entered the lists against him and been routed, except the quiet passenger, Williams. He had never been able to get an expression of opinion out of him on politics, but now... Just as the admiral drew near the door and the company were about to slip out, William said, Admiral, are you certain about that circumstance concerning the clergymen you mentioned the other day, referring to a piece of the admiral's manufactured history? Everyone was amazed at the man's rashness. The idea of deliberately inviting annihilation was a thing incomprehensible. The retreat came to a halt. Then everybody sat down again, wondering to await the upshot of it. The admiral himself was as surprised as anyone. He paused in the door with his red handkerchief half raised to his sweating face and contemplated the, di contemplated the daring reptile in the corner. Certain of it? Am I certain of it? Do you think I've been lying about it? What do you take me for? Anybody that don't know that circumstance don't know anything a child ought to know it. Read up your history. Read it up. Blank, 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 blank. And don't come asking a man if he's certain about a bit of ABC stuff that the very southern niggers know all about. Here the admiral's fires began to wax hot. The atmosphere thickened. The coming earthquake rumbled. He began to thunder and lighten. Indeed. Within three minutes, his volcano was in full eruption, and he was discharging flames and, and ashes of indignation, belching black volumes of foul history aloft, and vomiting red-hot torrents of profanity from his crater. Meantime, Williams sat silent and apparently deeply and, and earnestly interested in what the old man was saying. By and by, when the lull came, he said in the most differential way and with the gratified air of a man who has had a mystery cleared up which had been puzzling him uncomfortably. Now I understand it. I always thought I knew that piece of history well enough, but was still afraid to trust it, because there was not that convincing particularity about it that one likes to have in history. But when you mentioned every name the other day, and every date, and every little circumstance in their just order and sequence, I said to myself, this sounds something like, this is history. This is putting it in a shape that gives a man confidence. And I said to myself afterward, 
I will just ask the Admiral if he is perfectly certain about the details. And if he is, I will come out and thank him for clearing this matter up for me. And that is what I want to do now. For until you set that matter right, it was nothing but just a confusion in my mind, without head or tail to it. Nobody ever saw the Admiral look so mollified before, and so pleased. Nobody had ever received his bogus history as gospel before. Its genuineness had always been called in question, either by words or looks. But here was a man that not only swallowed it all down, but was grateful for the dose. He was taken aback. He hardly knew what to say. Even his profanity failed him. Now Williams continued, modestly and earnestly. But Avril, in saying that this was the first stone thrown, and that this precipitated the war, you have overlooked a circumstance which you are perfectly familiar with, but which has escaped your memory. Now I grant you that what you have stated is correct in every detail. To wit, that on the 16th of October, 1860, two Massachusetts clergymen named Waite and Granger went in disguise to the house of John Moody in Rockport at dead of night and dragged forth two southern women and their two little children, and after tarring and feathering them, conveyed them to Boston and burned them alive in the State House Square. And I also grant your proposition that this deed is what led to the secession of South Carolina on the 20th of December following. Very well. Here the company was pleasantly surprised to hear Williams proceed to come back at the Admiral with his own invincible weapon. Clean, pure, manufactured history without a word of truth in it. Very well, I say, but Admiral, why overlook the Willis and Morgan case in South Carolina? You are too well informed a man not to know all about the circumstance. Your arguments and your conversations have shown you to be intimately conversant with every detail of this national quarrel. You develop matters of history every day that show plainly that you are no smarter in it, content to nibble about the surface but a man who has searched the depths, that you are no smatterer in it, content to nibble about the surface, but a man who has searched the depths and possessed yourself of everything that has a bearing upon the great question. Therefore, let me just recall to your mind that Willis and Morgan case, though I see by your face that the whole thing is already passing through your memory at this moment. On the 12th of August, 1860, two months before the Waite and Granger affair, two South Carolina clergymen named John H. Morgan and Winthrop L. Willis, one a Methodist and the other an old school Baptist, disguised themselves and went at midnight to the house of a planter named Thompson, Archibald F. Thompson, vice president under Thomas Jefferson, and took thence at midnight his widowed aunt, a northern woman, and her adopted child, an orphan named Mortimer, an orphan named Mortimer Hughie, Higgy, afflicted with epilepsy and suffering at the time from white swelling on one of his legs, and compelled to walk on crutches in consequence. And the two ministers, in spite of the pleadings of the victims, dragged them to the bush, tarred and feathered them, and afterward burned them at the stake in the city of Charleston. You remember perfectly well what a stir it made. You remember perfectly well that even the Charleston Courier stigmatized the act as being unpleasant, of questionable propriety, and scarcely justifiable and likewise